focuses on marginalized groups in the early modern Atlantic world, which is roughly 1500 to 1700. She investigates the role of women, crypto Jews, and conversas in Spain and the Americas using literature, historical records, and the visual arts to inform her research. She's published on converso and crypto Jewish identity in the early modern period in E Humanista, Shakir, Cervantes Journal, and Hispanophila. Her recent book, Esther in Early Modern Iberia and the Sephardic Diaspora, Queen of the Conversas, was published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2017. She's co-editor with Brian M. Phillips of the forthcoming volume, Confined Women, and Paredadas, Malcasadas, and the Walls of Female Space in Inquisitorial Spain, uh, Hispanic Issues Online. In addition, she's working on a monograph on breastfeeding practices in the early modern world. Um, and Dr. Colbert Cairns conducted the research for this presentation during a sabbatical in the fall of 2019 where she set up a primary residence in Seville, Spain. And from there, she conducted primary research in hospital archives regarding the use of wet nurses and their orphan charges, and visited and studied significant artistic representations of the lactating virgin in the Museum of Bellas Artes within the Cathedral of Seville and the Archbishop's Palace. These paintings comprise a key aspect of her research. They rec reflect the widespread and popular appeal this topic had to an early modern Iberian audience. So now let's turn to the presentation, the culmination of Dr. Col Colbert Karen's sabbatical research. Her presentation is titled, best, Breast is Best in Early Modern Spain. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Colbert Karen. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Gretchen, for organizing this um, this new world of Zoom <laughs> presentations. Um, it's actually my second, well, second conference this way, so it's fun. Um, oh, I'm sorry, okay. I forgot. Uh, we do need to tell everyone that we're recording this session. Sorry. That's, That's fine. Blah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, so I just I um, I just wanted to start out by telling you how I got interested in this topic. Um, I was um, I started working on breastfeeding. I've always been interested in representations of the female body in the early modern period, so fifteen and sixteen hundreds, and um, religious others, and especially um, thinking about. Um, different roles that women had. And I was nursing my child and I was thinking, I wonder what people were saying. People have lots of comments today about the nursing woman body, about women's bodies in general. And so I thought, you know, what do they, what do they say? I wonder what theorists in the period that I research are talking about. And um, they have a lot to say. And it reminds me of, the, of this, the first time I presented on this work, I went to a conference in New Orleans and I was presenting on the role of the Virgin Mary and her breast and her nipple and how she, the fine female body and where she was located. And then um, my husband brought my son to me and he needed to nurse because he was only a few months old and I couldn't find a place. So I ended up in the bathroom and I had to pull my dress up over my head. And it was the first and only time I've ever nursed in a bathroom. So um, it just, you know, these issues of policing the woman's body, where is appropriate to nurse? Um, should women use formula? Should they not? What is the ideal mother? What is the ideal body? Um, there are issues that we're continuing to talk about today. And they, you know, they have, it's never ended. So, um, in general, my, the work I'm doing now is about maternal milk as this first female practice. So thinking about the woman's body and also uh, the, the mother's breast and then the, the wet nurse, because the 15 and 1600s, there was no formula. It's before formula. So if a, um, a mother couldn't nurse or if there was a very elite person, um, all of the elite people had wet nurses. So women, and especially among the royalty, um, because you know the, the role of a monarch was to reproduce. And if you're nursing longer, you can have less children less frequently. And so wet nursing was really used. So there's these conflicting discourses about upholding the mother's best 
uh, the mother's breast is best. Um, all the theorists said that, but then there was a lot of people using wet nurses at the same time. Um, and so I look at these, these ideas about controlling the female body, um, about her breast, her nipple, her milk, and about the idea that women transmitted family honor and through milk, purity and impurity was transmitted. In this period, in the early modern period, um, we have these purity of blood statutes in Spain, um, which said religious others, Jews and Muslims, are not old Christians, are not pure Christians. And even if you've converted, you can never get, you have the only way of being a pure Christian is to get to have four grandparents who were old Christians. And so the breast milk becomes one of these tools of this emerging Spanish nation to control their population. Um, and so I look at wet nurses through um, questions of religious identification before this period, early in the medieval period, wet nurses could be Jewish and Muslim, two Christian babies, then later on that gets banished and banned and only Christians could do that. Um, there's ideas about are dark skin nur wet nurses better or light skin nurses better, um, who could be a nurse who can't. Um, and my work looks a lot at these moralizing treatises that we see a lot of moralizing treatises today um, to think about. Um, there's a lot of treatises today that talk about the female body and what she should do, what she shouldn't do when she's pregnant. I'm thinking about, you know, women, some people say women shouldn't exercise when she's pregnant or you should avoid spicy foods because it could be bad for the baby. Um, there's a, a text that I've looked at from the 1600s that talks about um, how women shouldn't pregnant women shouldn't enter um, fruit orchards because they may become overexcited and have too many fruits and harm the baby. So these things, and this is of course written by a man. So these are things we've, these topics have been going on for a long time. Um, and so in my work, I look at literature, the wet nurse has been uh, kind of occupied this role of scapegoat where she's responsible if anything happens to the baby. Um, and lots of things did. A lot of wet nurses slept in the same beds as babies, and there was a lot of these cradle fires. Um, but she would, and so in that literature reflects um, the the nurse, the wet nurse as the scapegoat. Um, my talk today, I'm talking about archival sources that about wet nursing documents, um, real wet nursing documents from Seville, and also images. So um, images of the um, the the virgin lactans or the virgin of the milk and these are paintings and sculpture that are really prominent throughout spain italy um northern europe in the early modern so the 15 and 1600s uh so um my sabbatical research i conducted in sevilla in seville last fall and i was looking at these payments to the wet nurses these really detailed um kind of dry archives about documented 500 years of um the wet nursing tradition of the um in for these for orphans at this um um, basically an orphanage called the Casa Cuna in Seville. And it documents where they were from in the city. These are everyday people. Um, uh, what the babies were dressed in when they were dropped off at the orphanage, how they had this little door where they would turn babies in at night that you can turn um, without being noticed. You could drop a baby off at night, late at night, and then turn this little door in the side and they would be deposited safely within the, the orphanage. So that it was, um, so the documents were dry in themselves, but the context around them was very interesting. Um, and, um, and then of course, this long tradition, I went around the city to look at all of these different paintings and they're found throughout Spain, but there's a lot in, in, Spain, in Sevilla itself. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to discuss about the images, the, before the, um, the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic response to the Protestant Reformation, you could see tons of images of the, um, the bare breast, the one bare breast of the Virgin. After this period, the Counter-Reformation 1550s to 1650 started to ban, um, ban those images. And actually there's some that you can see covered up. They actually covered up the breast and then in later years they would remove that covering so these different ideas and different ideas of censorship and what's permissible and what's acceptable um 
and one of those, one of the uh, contemporary, a modern reference that I think of is there was a painting, and I wish I had a picture to show you, but there was a painting in LA that somebody did in the late 90s, early 2000s of um, a, a breastfeeding virgin. And there was this huge outcry by the community because they thought it was um, profane and inappropriate and they ended up taking it down. Although these images have been circulating for so many years previously. Um, so let me just, I wanted to share some images with you because my, my work, there was a lot of visual components. Um, so I'm just gonna share um, this brief presentation. Sorry, I have it at the back. So we're starting, um, I'm going to give you this visual tour of my work in Sevilla. And Sevilla, um, I'm sure most of you know, but you know, for those of you who aren't as familiar with Spain, it's located in southern Spain in Andalusia. Um, it's a, in the period that I'm talking about, it's a really significant place because it was one of the major cities of Europe, um, one of the biggest um, in the colonial enterprise. Anybody who went to the New World through Spain um, had to leave through Seville because that's where the major port was housed. And so there was just a ton of people um, from all different places coming through this one location. Um, as my students in our culture and civ class will know, um, uh, we've been talking, well, we're going to be talking about um, so Andalusia is part of the, uh, is an autonomous region in Spain. Um, and then the la the, in the first, so the 1500s, the first part of the early modern period is this really surge in um, importance. And then in the 1600s, we see a lot of decline. Um, there's, a dis there's a big plague, um, which we probably are all thinking there's a lot of, there's a plague happening now, um, a plague that killed off a quarter of the city. There was huge economic decline. The colonial enterprise did not bring in as much um, revenue as was expected. And so we see that kind of reflected in these um, uh, these the payments to the wet nurses because there's a t there's just a lot of orphans and a lot of poverty and, and malnutrition. Um, the paintings themselves um, are widespread and popular appeal across the Iberian world. Um, they're found in tons of buildings, um, particularly the art museum in Sevilla. And I, I have a fun fact I wanted to share. There was, um, I, I went specifically looking for a painting of um, a breastfeeding wet nurse, uh, uh, sorry, a breastfeeding virgin, and I couldn't find it. So I asked the, um, the, the, the people, the docents who were working there, and they said, oh, come with us. They, there was um, this triptych, so this three paneled painting that was open. And when it was open, you couldn't see but it, um, what was on the back, but the triptych was painted on one, two, three panels, but then also when you closed it, it was painted on. And there was a mirror and the, the, do the docent took me around back and said, oh, for the people who know it's here, we'll show it to you. And on the back, there was a picture of this breastfeeding virgin. So I felt very pr one of the privileged people who got to see this. Um, um, there's paintings in the cathedral, the palace of the archbishop, wet nurses, and um, a series of wet nurses uh, for the royal families in the Alcazar, which everybody visits in Spain, in, in Sevilla. And these, it shows how important the wet nurses were to the royal families because they were, they were living, they were become um, people who would take care of the children of the royalty. So it's a really, they have an important tradition in Spain, even while um, the theorists are saying mother's breast is always what's best. We have this real tension. So, okay, the first place that I um, we started, I started, or one of the places is the Cathedral of Seville. And as you can see, it's this huge um, cathedral. Um, it was actually there's part of it that was um, um, from the Muslim was a Muslim mosque beforehand, a very small part of it. And for those of you who are familiar with Spanish history. Spain was under Muslim rule, almost all of Spain, except the very north, under Muslim rule for 700 years. And so, um, and you can see that in the, in the buildings. Um, in this paint, in this, in the cathedrals located right in downtown um, Sevilla. Um, and it's a really important place. Right in the center of this cathedral is this painting, the Virgen de los Remedios, or the Virgin of Remedies. So immediately we're thinking of health concerns, um, 
and the Virgin as um, healing. And this is an anonymous, an anonymous painting. Um, there's, you can see the one bare breast, the kind of open mouth of both the baby and the Virgin. And here she's really here to humanize. She's a real figure. She's, kind of, she's considered the mother to all of humanity. And some have argued a wet nurse to all of humanity. Um, the, it reflects the 14th century traditions and it's, it's just in this really prominent place of this important church. And so, um, and I find it just really visually appealing as well. Um, another painting that is also um, prominent, it's a big altarpiece, the purification of the Virgin. Um, and if we just take a closer look, this is later, this is 1555. Um, uh, so one of the later paintings that was done in this tradition, because they're, they're you know, showing the breast was outlawed later on. Um, but up until this period, there was milk sharing amongst religious groups, conversos and moriscos um, would have shared them, uh, Jews and Muslims would have shared milk with Christians. Um, and we hear, we, there's a presentation in the center of the Virgin with um, Jesus, but then there's also this woman on the side who has two breasts exposed and is nursing in the painting. So this is one of these um, um, paintings that's impacted by the politics of reconquest, of the of Catholic reconquest of the peninsula. Um, but it's it's impressive in all of these female figures that um, that appear. Um, okay, taking a little switch, the the place I went to every day, um, the cathedral was a fun, a really fun visit on one day. But every day I would go to the Diputación de Sevilla, which is um, um, just kind of like a council, it was council archives, but also where a lot of things happen to run the city. And it's also in the center of the city and walking distance to the cathedral, to the museum. Um, and where I looked here at these everyday account books um, of the payments to the wet nurses, because this was something they had to keep track of. It was a really expensive endeavor. I read some studies that were saying, you know, a baby that lasted up until they needed to be weaned about two years old at this time was really expensive because you had to employ women and these women would take babies and um, to their homes and they would live with them. Unlike the elite who would have wet nurses come um, and they, the wet nurses would go to the elite's homes. Um, so the documents looked like this, like the ones on the left. Um, they covered five centuries. I picked one book from 1637 to 38 to look at and you can see there's a count there's a counting on the right side, the numbers, how much the wet nurses were being paid. Um, they, in other parts, they would say where the wet nurses lived in the city. And it was really fun to read the street names because most of these women came from these two popular kind of poor neighborhoods, Triana and Macarena neighborhoods. And we le lived in the Macarena. So it was really fun to see the names of streets that I would walk on every day appear in these books. Um, and it's a question about how the most humble are treated by society. And there is a lot, um, some, of the, some of the little human pieces were, you know, they were sad. There was a, a father going to the Americas, dropping off their child. And there wasn't a lot of details that way, but um, it's, it, it gives an, a different picture of the early modern period. Um, on the right is the book of protocols um, from the Casa Cuna and the Casa Cuna is this orphanage. And I just, the, the book itself is very beautiful. So I wanted to show you what that looked like. And these are of course unpublished documents. And this is the title page. And then this really sweet illustration of the Casa Cuna. And I don't think it was as grand as they made it out to be with these three or six babies in one bed, but there was a, it was a lot of need in this period. Um, so the, the last thing I did in the, um, in the Casa Cuna, in the Diputación, is there's this book, the um, Breve Discur Discurso Breve by Luis Brochero, who was a humanist from Seville. Um, and he was writing about the plight of the orphans and also the, um, the, that the orphans needed more care, that in this period of decline in Sevilla, um, they needed more help and there wasn't enough money for them and there wasn't enough care. Um, at the same time, he was writing a moralizing treatise about how women should, mothers should breastfeed their own children. And so, you know, how, if you have an orphan, you obviously can't do that. So there is these kind of, this, these tensions are reflected again and again. 
Um, and the last image I have here is um, this sculpture from, from the Milk version from the University of Sevilla. And so, as I, you know, you can go anywhere and find these images. And um, my colleague Esther Alaconarana, she studied, this is her alma mater, and this is right in the chapel. Um, and so these paintings are, they're, they're really all over, they're ubiquitous. Um, and so going around, um, going around Spain today, um, you see breastfeeding in a much more open way, I would say, than in the U.S. Um, it's, people do it for long, f until children are longer, it's more open, um, and so the question of breastfeeding in public is less of a, of um, an issue, and I'm not, um, I still, I'm yet to reflect if it's, a, it's, if it's based on these earlier paintings or if they're, the cultures come around, um, but um, a, an interesting fact for me was I was chatting with a, um, a friend that I made there, you know, telling them about my research. And he said, oh, you might find this interesting. I was talking to my dad the other day. We were walking, and this is in the Macarena district where we were living. And they said, you know, my dad said, oh, that's my milk, my, mi hermano de leche, my milk brother. And a milk brother is somebody who had the same wet nurse. So this is a guy who's maybe his 70s or 80s, the father of my friend. And he, ha he had a wet, his wet nurse, kind of a local woman, was the same had, he had a friend and they, called, they were called milk brothers because they shared milk from the same woman. And in the Muslim tradition, you're not allowed to marry a milk brother or a milk sister or anybody in that family. Um, and that's, there's a long tradition with that. But he, but he was walking around and he said, that's, that's who he is. So in Franco Spain, in the, you know, the, in the mid century Franco Spain, although there was formula, it was invented in the 1890s. It was a poor country, and so wet nursing was still used, not exclusively, but it was still happening. Um, so I just, so there's these, these pieces, and it's part of popular culture. There was a Spanish TV show called Milk Brothers um, that was going on in the 90s also. Um, so in breastfeeding, what I find so interesting is they, we go between what's secret and what's public, what's private and what's in the, the public sphere. Um, any modern mo mother knows that the sight of a woman breastfeeding is confronting to some. Perhaps less understood is that this is nothing new. What is quite clear as we unpack common images of the lactating Virgin Mary of the medieval and early modern periods. In this period, both women, Jewish and Muslim women, could be wet nurses to Christian babies until the sweeping changes of the Spanish Reconquest outlawed milk sharing across religious lines. Religious others clashed with patriarchal production of what is considered an ideal motherhood. And societal reform increased scrutiny on the female body in general and the nursing nipple in particular, from the virgin lactans or the virgin of the milk to Janet Jackson, the nipple has always been front and center in a male-led discussion of morality. Um, so thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to chat. <laughs> and feel free to um, either unmute yourself and speak up or put a question in the chat and uh, Gretchen and I will read it. It's funny being in a in a zoom context for a conference for chat. Yes. It's a lot of the chatting happens over snacks, but that's right. Snacks <laughs> individually. I have my that's, coffee. <laughs> that's what we really lost is the cookies we need to get. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So, well, I was, I was wondering, I mean, women, women just didn't, um, was there so much societal pressure during that time that even, did they just not even want to nurse? I'm, you know, um, was there really no choice? Yeah, I mean, it depends. So in the early modern period, it depended, it, it depended a lot on your social status. So really elite women just didn't. Um, it was considered, you know, lower status to do so. You were out of commission to having children for a while. It was, could be considered annoying because you can't, you know, your, your timing is different. You can't just go off and do things. Um, so, 
um, I think there was people who couldn't afford to have a wet nurse. And then there was a whole layer of, of you know, the elite sweat nurses occupied this higher position and they had certain qualifications and status of background that they had to check with. Um, and then you kind of go down and those are the live in and they had in some of the queens have in their in their wills they would or not even yeah in their wills they would leave parcels of land homes these people were really important to them but then as you go down you have women lots of women in the countryside who would take in a few different babies at once and those weren't as prestigious but they also there was an, the issue was um you could nurse a few babies at the same time which wasn't as good um, because you wanted all the milk to go to one and so if you had somebody who lived in with you you could control that um, there's also, and there is, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of different types of regulations that, that went in that way too. Uh, we have a couple questions. Um, Father Scott says, thanks for the talk. I was rather interested in learning more because in Portugal, there are numerous images of virgin, the virgin breastfeeding, fascinating information about milk brothers and in, interfaith nursing. And um, Michelle Phelps says, could you speak on the relationship of your research to the Shrine of Our Lady La Leche in St. Augustine? Yeah, so I haven't actually, so I haven't actually studied um, that shrine, but this is, it's part, that particular one, but this is part of a, a pretty global um, enterprise of the Virgin, especially, and the St. Augustine was a Spanish colony, so, um, or part of the Spanish colonial world. So this really did make its way across to the Americas. So it's a really a transatlantic phenomenon. And there's the, um, there's different types of virgins that are represented in Mexico also, and um, of the breastfeeding, and she has different, uh, different, different manifestations, but it's a really interesting way of looking at the world through these and and these women meant a lot the women who would go to them for fertility types of things later on um they were a figure they could connect with she was um you know part of that is also you see in a lot of these paintings you see these this perfect virgin nursing a baby and she's relaxed and everything's going well and for any of us who've nursed and, may, and any of us who've seen other people nurse it's not always peaceful and it can be really trying and things happen at the wrong times and so there's also these conflicting images to women of here be a perfect mother and here's how you be an ideal mother and so i think um those are kind of common topics that get translated throughout um and in the, and in the portuguese world too this there's we can i mean i i this is part of a, a much bigger project right i'm trying to see exactly where the scope begins and ends but making this conversation between all of the, this, the Hispanic world, but also the, the, um, the English speaking world. And it's, and there's also in um, the Netherlands and there was, you know, there was part of Spain, the low countries in this period too, there was a lot of back and forth with artistic representations and, and such. So, so yeah. Was this in, so was this a European phenomenon? Like it was a, across Europe? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And in Italy, there's a lot also. There's, and there's different, um, there's been a, um, different amounts of studies. Wet nurse is not as much in Italy, but in terms of paintings, a lot of studying of, um, of these images. Yeah. And then also, well, I guess also the location of wet nurses in the countryside and, and, um, I'm kind of going through my, but yeah, this is a European phenomenon for sure. It manifested differently in Spain because of the Counter-Reformation um, and what, and so the Counter-Reformation squashed these paintings earlier than in other places. Um, and what I'm particularly interested in is what did these milk practices look like or what, what was the Jewish or Muslim reception or a Morisco or a Converso reception of these paintings? Because if you were a converted Jew living in Spain, or a secret Jew, you're seeing these images everywhere, but how do they resonate? And they have to resonate in a certain way, but is it different? So that's kind of where I'm trying to go next um, with this project. Um, Dr. Candela wants to know, in terms of artistic representations, do I take it that most, if not all of the artists were male? Any evidence of female artists? 
Yeah, no, that's, um, most of the artists were, I don't know of any female artists um, who claimed ownership of these of any of these images. And the same with the treatises. I didn't really talk that many about these moralizing texts and these didactic texts. And there's a lot. And they have these really, some of these, you know, these things about women, like what women should do and what they shouldn't do. And they're, most of them are all written by men also. I've, I came across, I've, I've worked on one that was written by um, this very prominent nun. Um, about also saying breast is, mother's breast is best and it should be the mother who's who is doing the feeding um, but um, it's it's a really male it's a really male um, a real patriarchal um, creation yeah and so we have another attention of course yeah I have a question. Sure. Uh, no one else. Um, so I'm just curious. I loved hearing about how you kind of got sparked with this when when you were a mother, when you are a mother, but when you were breastfeeding Ren, um, mm -hmm. you know, when he was small, how that kind of like drove you to be so passionate about the topic. Like I was wondering if that made you focus your sabbatical on that topic or if you already had planned it or like if that was something that like fueled your passion for the topic mm -hmm. like what what made you want to go to Sevilla there specifically and then study this um I don't know topic yeah thanks Mary um it yeah well the sabbatical was the project came a little later but the um it was definitely my personal um experience that shaped this project. I, I was always interested in the body and the female body and representations and how the female body, it was, people wanted to control it so heavily in the early modern period and as part of these lim of limpieza de sangre, the purity of blood statutes and how that translated to the new world. But then as my own personal experience changed, it shaped um, the direction of my work. So it was like, okay, so I was saying, okay, what are conversos experiencing with this? How are religious others, if they're already considered impure and then they're passing impurities through their breast milk? Because they considered it, the, the blood purity was through their blood. And in this period, breast milk was considered a purified form of blood. And there's tons of stuff written about it. So um, so yeah, and then the, 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 the Sevilla part, came later, I was just looking, where are records that people haven't looked at and what else can I, and, and where are paintings too? But there's a, but really throughout Spain, there's a lot of different options. And the more you start to look, the more I realize how much there is out there. Yeah. Dr. Mitchell has a question. Um, in other countries in Europe during this period, particularly those without major contact with the Muslim world, for many years, did this look different? Certainly, anti-Semitism was a pan-European phenomenon, but there were but were there places where the fears about cross-contamination were less? Yeah, um, definitely. I think Spain is a particular, um, in terms of contamination, a particularly heated spot because of these politics of you know the Spanish reconquest of the peninsula, which as we talk about in my class is a myth of, of racial purity, that Spain was at one point totally Christian. Um, it was under Muslim rule as you know 700 years and um, the idea of recuperating a, a pure past goes comes up again it bubbles up again and again in Spain so I do think it's particular there the question about um, in Islamic traditions the there's a, a really long history and it's really interesting and I don't know as much about this but the um, the there's a whole um, literature writing and in the Quran too about um, the the pro, like the prophet Muhammad's has a, a special wet nurse who raises him and they're from a particular tribe and it goes and it lists out all of the um, people who are part of your um, your um, your family your milk family and so who's even somebody by mar somebody who's married who's married in your family you can't marry there's like rules about marriage 
based on that. And so there's a long tradition that way. And because Spain in the medieval period was such a um, diverse, multicultural place, these issues do manifest really differently in Spain. Thanks, James. <laughs> Um, um, we have another one. Um, Tim Neary, Dr. Neary would like to know, Emily, have you found that many other 21st century scholars, whether inside or outside the U.S., are exploring the topic of early modern breastfeeding in Spain and or other European countries? If so, do you find yourself situated within a particular camp or perspective within the literature on this topic? Um... Let me read that to myself one more time. <laughs> okay. Okay, early members reading in Spain and other countries. Um, you know, there are people, ex there's, a, there's people who explore, um, I've read a, a lot about medieval practices and I kind of come in at the late medieval, early modern. Um, so there, it, the, and I may just not find it, but the Converso Morisco um, discussion about breastfeeding practices and purity has kind of happened tangentially through these blood purity statutes and through blood. Um, the medieval period, there's, a, there's been some really, really interesting articles about Jewish wet nurses to Christian families, also the use of slaves and slaves from Northern Africa and from different places from different religions being used um, because, um, and they were considered the best wet nurses at some points, and then later it became outlawed, and slavery existed for a long, you know, a good while in Spain also, and so there's, and, um, and that's, that happens kind of, um, there's things written about the, the Aragon Empire more in Catalonia, but anyway, I'm kind of losing in the weeds. So, um, there's a lot also written about, um, the artistic, the, these, these visual representations. Um, in terms of a camp, I haven't quite found um, one to, to I, I kind of agree with different pieces from different ones, but I'm not really, um, there's definitely people working on this. Um, and then there's people working on it in a contemporary perspective too. Um, I read this interesting book called Exceptional Feeders and Different Ways of Breastfeeding to, in Today's World. And so that's those kind of connections, those, those are the connections I really want to make. So I ask any of you and, and my students too, please, the book that I'd like to, that I'm working on now is, I really want it to be um, geared towards an educated, um, non-specialist. And so what ideas resonate with you? What's interesting? Um, and, um, the, and our current world too, because the, the thing that I find interesting about the early modern period, medieval period is the topics that are important to us are still important to us. There was a plague in Spain, in Sevilla. There's a, a pandemic today. There's people telling other people what to do with their bodies. That's still happening. So all of these topics I just see I don't know for a cycle, but they just keep kind of going up and down and around. Yeah. It's really interesting. Uh, we have another question. I'm just going to sneak in here. Um, the, uh, from uh, Ernie Jolie Kerr. And uh, that's interesting you say that because I have a cousin, my, one of my Brooklyn cousins who was overproducing and she told me she's donating to a milk bank. Right. And, you know, also making soap mm -hmm. <laughs> and stuff, um, yeah. which yeah. Uh, there's different reactions to, to that, I think, probably today, yeah. culturally. Um, sure. And I was, and just with, on that idea too, one of, there's some, there's been some issues in um, Northern, Northern California where women are buying milk from a milk bank from different third world countries. Oh. Like, or developing countries. So I, th oh. I think maybe, well, maybe I don't, um, maybe Vietnam, but there was an issue with women getting, selling their milk and as a, a, a way of, you know, in the early modern period too, it was, it could be pretty profitable if you're working for the right family. And so they were selling their milk and this is just recently and going to these people, you know, women who either don't want to nurse or can't nurse, but it's problematic because whose body is producing what and who's getting the benefits 
Right. Is, are there children? Yeah. Are there children? Right. And what's happening? Yeah. What's happening to their kids? And formula is expensive. There was, and the whole issue with um, Nestle pushing formula mm -hmm. in um, Latin America um, when water could be, when it can be a great option, but if water's contaminated, that's not a great option. So there's a lot of. Yeah. Um, um, and this question from Ernie Julie Kerr, uh, have you examined these representations of women breastfeeding across the spectrum from the sacred to the profane? There's a long history of no Nobel family portraits that mm -hmm. in, noble family portraits that involve the mother often overdressed breastfeeding. Do you think this is a tradition of portraiture? This tradition of portraiture is linked to our in, or inspired by these images of virgin breastfeeding? Hmm. That, I would say, yes, yeah, but I have to really look, I want to look at that. That's thanks, Ernie. I think that's really interesting. Um, if she's, and she's this, you know, the virgin is this idealized version of a mud, of a, the ideal version of a mother. And they're also, the painters are particularly interested in humanizing her as it becomes, as we move away from the 13, 1400s into the 15, 1600s, and especially in the Italian tradition, it's really to make a more accessible, humble version. Um, we're also talking about Ernie's suggesting elite families who, you know, those are the ones getting represented with portraiture, but, but yeah, I would think that's, I need to really look at that because they're modeling themselves after, you know, who else would they model themselves after more highly? Mm. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that, that this role is very simultaneously very important to the extent that in like in Islamic culture, it's like it identifies your family and and yet at the same time they acknowledge that there's people who are considered lower or less than like enslaved people mm -hmm. who are also so there must be some conflict in like the how you know if they're like a hermano leche did you say and mm -hmm. then at the same time they've enslaved the woman sure. who's doing that right Right. No. And there's also all of, no, that's a great point. And there's also um, a lot of things that say, um, you know, we're talking about maintaining the family line and having this pure body passed along. And so some of the arguments for having the mother being the, nur the nursing is get to keep that line. But when you introduce these other, other people you can't control them as well and so a lot of the theorists start to talk about well the best thing is to have the mother but if you can't here's what you should pick here's seven attributes you should pick in a wet nurse and they kind of go through um, these attributes and then they'll say you know these are this is the diet for anybody who's nursing and this is you should pick somebody who's of um, not too big not too heavy not too small and somebody who eats well but not too much and they really go into these details so it's not so much the woman as the milk she produces, her product. Yeah. And then I, I think, think in the and in the elite it does matter where she's from, you know, mm. which families. The elite picked more elite wet nurses also from the right background who could transmit the right family um and the right upbringing because um like breast milk also connoted moral um um moral attributes to the children. Huh. And, wow. and transmit it. There was, there were, it was, it was this very powerful substance that could go everywhere. Wow. That is so interesting. And Father Scott, uh, I have two more questions here. Father Scott says, I know there's a female artist, Josefa de Obidos, who was baptized in Seville, but raised in Portugal and has a number of pieces of artwork all over Portugal. I was wondering if you knew about her or could speak about her artwork in particular as a female artist at the time. No, but I was, um, I'm going to make myself a note to look, to look her up. Yeah, that's really, in, um, it's interesting. I'm always looking for the women who are, I think they're highly instrumental in culture and as they're, they're being written about so much because of that, but we don't see them represented nearly as much. And so, um, and there's all these scholars I've heard of, so there's different ways of different reading things. So even reading these 
these payments to the wet nurses as ways of recuperating the voices, even if the person writing the scribe was male. But anyway, to, to look at an actual female artist would be really exciting. So I will um, jot down her name and take a look for sure. Thank you. Emma wonders, she says that it's evidence that this information is quite different from today's world, but was there anything specifically that surprised you the most? Um, I guess um, just how wide, just how widespread, how you can find these things in so many places. Um, in the in the New World, also in in well in the Americas, in the in the British Americas, in the in North America, there was advertisements for advertising for wet nurses and the qualities mm -hmm. that you wanted in them. And so once you start to look, it's like it was a big business and it represented significant economic impact. And so we're talking now, you know, 17, 1800s or something, 1700s, late 1600s. Um, and they happen in different waves. Um, and so I guess just those, how those differences manifest, formula happened earlier in England than in the Spanish speaking world. Um, and it really changed the nature of, um, of that industry there. Um, and just the roles of, of different women, but but yeah, the, the kind of widespread, I mean, everybody needs, all the babies need to eat. And so it's how it happens. It's also interesting because you could see it as having the potential to provide, to empower women or provide them with some economic liberation, except mm -hmm. the process itself is so all encompassing that it's almost like they wouldn't have the ability. Right. It's, it, it doesn't allow them to really yeah. be liberated. In terms of domestic work, it was one of the highest paid domestic work you could do, but also in the, you know, the husbands were highly involved and a lot of times mm. you wanted a married woman who wouldn't have um, sexual relations because that was bad for milk and, um, or considered bad for milk. And then um, they would sign off on these, you know, these these contracts basically and they would she would live for a certain period of time and she'd get paid a certain amount of money so um yeah i think there's both of those things happening for sure it's very interesting um hi dr colbert karens um great hi, to see Aaron. you actually <laughs> hi thank nice you too. um you mentioned um while you were there on sabbatical um kind of walking around um you were seeing uh, women who were breastfeeding um, kind of in public and it was, um, it seemed pretty um, like open. Mm -hmm. And then um, I can't remember if it was a museum um, or like where it was, but uh, you mentioned how you had to have a dochen um, take you around to see um, the depiction of um, the breastfeeding version. So would you say um, museums and that kind of thing, would are they, is there a push to kind of bring that kind of out from you know behind the the curtain and kind of um uh you know uncover the you know the coverings that were on you know paintings and that kind of thing now or is it still kind of um i don't know controversial or kind of hidden um is, yeah. it, is it kind of leaning more toward um being more accepted yeah they, that's a great question. I think it's definitely leaning towards being more accepted. It's they are displayed, and I think in that particular one, it was maybe the, a feature of the actual um, piece itself. But I was kind of reading into it, like even in the cathedral, it, they were listed virgin, like milk virgin, but you kind of, but that's it. They didn't really go into details. And I'm thinking this is huge. This is such an important, and I, I mean, it's my bias too what I'm researching. But it didn't seem like there was quite as much attention to those roles, even though, but it was there in public. So um, I do think there is, um, and maybe because it's, we're talking a few hundred centuries, we're talking hundreds of years ago, but there is, um, it does seem to be definitely the envelope is turning a different way and there is an openness and a willingness to discuss it. In the cathedral, I found it interesting because it was, it was, dis, it was there, but kind of not as discussed, which I thought maybe was intentional, but I still need to, you know, I'm not sure if that was my bias. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. But that like the covering women in the U S you know, even people who are really pro breastfeeding, they really, those covers that you could just really cover yourself with, I just didn't see at all. I mean, maybe it was huh. where I was, but 
um, it, it just struck me. Yeah. Hmm. Well, if anyone's typing, go ahead and finish mm -hmm. typing and I'll grab it. But uh, if not, um, this was very interesting. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you, thank you. everyone for attending. Um, and uh, I would like to just give you uh, a heads up that we have um, two more presentations coming up. Um, and uh, I'm going to put this in the chat. Um, we have uh, Dr. Ramsey on Monday, October 10th, and Dr. Mangieri on Tuesday, November 10th, November 10th. Um, and we are just, uh, as you can tell from this, this presentation, they're just very exciting and interesting and a great opportunity to get together and consult an expert on these really interesting topics. So thank you again, Emily. And I'm sorry we can't have cookies now, but. I know, I'll take a rain this was, check. <laughs> this is fun too. <laughs> so thank you all. And I hope you have a great night. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. That was fascinating. Thanks, Thank Gretchen you. and Dawn. <laughs>